Today, we are going to be talking about hemp flour, um, producing essential oils and smokable flower bud, and what's happening both here in Vermont and at SUNY Morrisville with Jennifer Gilbert Jenkins again today joining us and Scott Lewins as well. We'll be talking about the pest survey that we've been doing around the Northeast just to get everyone excited about the various critters that are out there ready to tackle your crop at any moment. So with that, we should dive into the webinar topic today. So uh, a lot of you know that we've been conducting hemp flower trials up at the research farm now for I think about four years and just keep diving into different management practices that we wanna evaluate and try to produce some scientifically based data to help farmers grow hemp, again, really for the flour or to extract out the various essential oils and terpenes that people are interested in. Um, so we have a, a number of research trials going on and over the years, you know, I'm sure you've all heard all of us talking about them and some of the results. And these are the trials that we have ongoing this year. So I know some of you attended the field day up at Borderview that we had in August, I think. And so some, some of you were able to see the variety trial that we have, um, as well as the fertility trials. We have a cropping system trial that we're conducting, um, an auto flower variety trial. We also have a fungicide trial that we're getting ready to harvest at this point. Um, a harvest date study where we're looking at harvest timing and the impact on cannabinoids and terpenes. And then we're also continuing our trials, looking at the impact of temperature, um, drying temperature on terpenes and cannabinoids in the, in the hemp. And finally, we're part of a national um, variety trial that's again, spread out across the nation a group of universities looking at the same variety, same six varieties, um, you know, in Kentucky, in Colorado, in California, in Oregon, in Wisconsin, and in New York. So we can see how these varieties perform similarly or different depending on the location across the country. So this isn't really everything that we would like to do, but honestly, if I know many of you have harvested hemp before <laughs> and you know how much work it is to, to get the hemp harvested and it's not really any different on a research farm. So our ability to experiment and expand our trials is really you know, mostly limited by the amount of labor that we have to, to process um, all the plants and the trial results. So we're looking for people to help harvest, <laughs> put out a shameless, like, want to come volunteer tomorrow at 9 a.m., 9 to 3. Um, but yeah, so, that, so that's a barrier. It's a barrier on farms, and it's also a barrier when you're doing research is trying to be able to collect really great data um, and get everything harvested timely. So that's what I feel like we're mostly up against and we have been harvesting now for a few weeks and we'll continue doing so probably for the next three weeks as well. So the variety trial has keeps getting bigger <laughs> um, over the years. I think we started with maybe three or four varieties and now in our 2021 trial, we have 27 different cultivars. We did have to kind of limit, limit that again, just because of capacity. And you can kind of see from, from the photo on the left that there's lots of different shapes and sizes out in the field growing. And if you were able to view the trials, um, you can see just the diversity in the varieties. And somebody had asked at the field day, you know, 
uh, what do you think the best variety farm in the Northeast? And, you know, like every really good extension person, I think my answer was, it depends. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's interesting, you can see this smallish plant over here to the left, and then these kind of humongous plants to the right. And again, I feel like if you've harvested um, hemp plants, you know that those 40 pound Christmas trees um, take a lot of time to harvest and may not even produce as much yield as a smaller, more compact plant with less leaves putting all of its energy into flower buds and less energy into stems and leaves. So part of what we're looking at is, is that, you know, how long does it take to harvest a single plant of these varieties? And how much bud does the variety produce versus stems and leaves? Really to get a handle on um, harvest efficiency and where you should be kind of, if you wanna be investing your time and, you know, one person four hours to harvest the plant, you know, that's certainly your, your business, but we're really looking at what varieties are out there that can be efficiently harvested by hand and produce the kind of um, CBD concentration or terpene um, concentrations that we would like to see. So beyond just looking at, you know, harvest efficiencies and the kind of makeup of the plant, how big it is, how many leaves, stems, and buds, we also are obviously looking at other important characteristics like um, pest tolerance. And um, John and Scott have been scouting these plants weekly, trying to figure out which ones have any sort of tolerance to the various pests that we see, especially diseases, which is really critical in, in our growing region, of course. All right, so this is the data from last year. And again, just kind of trying to show you what we're collecting and certainly open to collecting other data as well. But what I want you to note here is um, the varieties are listed on the left and the planting week. So this is out of 52 weeks in a year, right? So basically um, let's just look at, you know, the top five, they were all planted around the 26 week of the year. And then most of them started flowering about six to eight weeks later. And then we're ready to harvest six to eight weeks later. So again, we're looking at a, you know, depending on the variety again, a nine to 16 week um, crop from the time of planting. And again, this is transplanting uh, plants out. And this, you know, is in early June to mid June. All right. So the, the plants are relatively consistent in that way, although we do have some that take a little longer to mature. So you can see if you kind of look down at the bottom, some of these are really going out into 43 plus weeks. And the reason it says plus is because we had to harvest these at the end of October. You know, it was really cold last year. I, almost, I think it even snowed. Um, a couple of times in October, and they were really just falling apart from the environment, but they weren't yet mature. So I feel like this is the kind of data that our growers really need to be successful because there's a lot of varieties now out on the market. There's quite a bit to choose from and whether or not they're going to make maturity here is really important. And again, as a grower, if you want to be harvesting in November, that again is completely up to you. But if you want to get those varieties harvested now, you know, in September and early October, then this kind of data can help you determine what can I grow that's going to meet my needs and get me out of the field before the snow flies. All right. Here, oh, somebody's, oh, good excuse. Did you see this? Somebody wants to help us from Germany. Now that's not even fair. <laughs> Okay, um, as far as the pests that 
we've been seeing this year, and I know Scott's going to talk about more about this, but hemp borer, we've been seeing, um, and you can see some examples of this. And then again, a lot of lodging, which is really important for us to know because, you know, we get storms. Once you get those really huge plants that are really lots of branches, they become more prone to lodging, falling over, um, getting on the ground, getting covered with soil, being more prone to disease. So again, monitoring those things are really important so that you know what's going to work best. Huh, I wonder why my thing's not working. Why is it not working? Doesn't want to work. There we go. Boop. Some other diseases, powdery mildew, um, and then white mold, uh, which is, you know, both of these are diseases that we see throughout the trial. All right, last year we had a lot of frost damage, and you can see the varieties that, again, didn't make it. I mean, we just kept getting frost after frost after frost, and you can see the damage on these plants. What we do know from our research. I just wanted to briefly talk about. Why did that do that? Oh, it must be. And what we learned. There we go. Um, but what we've learned over time is that the frost itself, the cold temperatures, at least if the plant um, experiences temperatures below 28, three or four times, it doesn't seem to really hurt the cannabinoid. Uh, concentrations or the terpenes, but the leaves start to degrade and the stems also start to degrade. And um, obviously over time, that's not good for the overall quality of the plant. So harvest maturity is important for our region, for sure. Um, we've been lucky this year. We haven't gotten a frost yet, but that could change at any moment. Here are the yields. These are flower yields. Um, from the different varieties. And you can see again, that really differs depending on the variety. Um, this isn't an, an endorsement for any particular any particular variety, but just to simply show you that they do range. Um, this doesn't correlate with uh, harvest efficiency always either. So again, this is just how many dry matter pounds of flour you can get from these varieties um, in Vermont. And this is the cannabinoid concentrations, or I'm sorry, yeah, the um, dominant cannabinoid. So in most cases, it's CBD, and in some cases, it's CBG. And you can see the difference among the varieties as well. I did put in the uh, THC values on top of the bars, and then the red line shows you um, at what point uh, we're going above compliance. It's a little bit off out of whack there, but you can see many of the varieties were above the compliant level of 0.3. All right, so we're also looking at crop rotation. And I said, we have a cropping system study that we're doing. And again, that's because hemp is susceptible to lots of different diseases and pests. And it's really important to rotate the crop. Um, what we're finding preliminarily right now and just makes sense from a basic agronomic best management practices is that ideally you should be rotating out of hemp every couple of years. Um, ideally, you don't really want to be growing hemp two years in a row in the field, um, but if you need to utilize that particular area um, in more than one year, two years should be the maximum. And after that, you're going to start seeing really increased disease levels. Um, and you can see a photo up on the top here. This is Septoria leaf spot, um, which one of the growers we work with, which was in their second year of hemp um, or third year actually, just went downhill really quickly from Septor Septoria. They have since rotated um, out of that field, but I think a lot of people have this you know, perspective that you can just keep growing hemp on the five acres that you own, but really it needs to be rotated. Um, 
and to minimize disease buildup because some of the diseases that this crop gets are, are pretty nasty and they last in the soil for a really long time. So if you start building up white mold, sclerotinia, um, propagules in your field, you're looking at, in some cases, having to abandon that field for six to eight years. So you definitely um, need to be considering rotation um, and implementing it as well. So we, part of our study is to look at hemp, not just to see how many years we should grow hemp before the whole picture falls apart, but what crops will benefit from being in a rotation with hemp. And there isn't really a lot of data out there, you know, telling us like, well, hemp benefits other crops, um, or doesn't benefit other crops in a rotation. There is very little data out there um, on rotations with hemp. And so our rotation with hemp will involve a grass species, an annual grass species, and an annual legume species. So we're using, for the purposes of this study, corn and um, snap beans. We'll keep you posted on the results of that. So there is a- Okay. So we've been working on fertility and continue to work on fertility in hemp, uh, especially nitrogen. And we've done this study now, we're going into our third year of looking at various nitrogen rates applied um, prior, to, prior, prior to flowering. So we do split applications of nitrogen throughout the vegetative period and we apply zero nitrogen up to 150 pounds. Um, and essentially we kind of see the plant um, level off and how much nitrogen it takes up at about 125 pounds of nitrogen. So that doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot, <laughs> mean a whole lot. Um, because it doesn't exactly tell us of the 125 pounds we applied, what the crop actually was able to get. But we do know that in our environment, um, that is a target for us to use. We have a lot more research to do to fine tune these recommendations. But since there's nothing else out there, this is what we've been going with. And again, this is whole plant analysis. Um, and you can see, I keep only seeing my big fat face in the screen. <laughs> I don't know why. Get rid of it. It's so annoying. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> All right. So again, that was the whole plant, the concentration of nitrogen in the entire plant. And then this is the weight of the entire plant. And again, you can see it's um, pretty variable here that the weight of the plant maxes out at 75 pounds of nitrogen, right? So the plant doesn't seem to be getting any bigger statistically if we add more than 75 pounds of nitrogen. But when we look at the uptake into the plant, when we added 125 pounds, the plant wasn't gonna take up any more nitrogen when we applied more than that. So again, there's a lot of variation here. There's still a lot to figure out. Um, here, I'm going to go to my next slide. But again, what we know is that we need nitrogen to grow the plants. All right. Uh, sorry. There's like a very significant delay. Uh, Charest was asking if all the N was applied before planting. And no, it wasn't. We applied 50 pounds um, at planting, and then we spread over the remainder of the application rate um, over the remainder of weeks prior to flowering. So we were applying a little bit each week. I don't know. There we go. OK. So here's the impact on yields. And again, you can see um, for flower yield, there was no statistical difference 
between any of the rates. So the nitrogen was definitely having what seemed to be more of an impact on plant biomass than on anything else. Uh, okay. It's taking a long time to switch. Okay, there are a couple of questions I'll answer why I'm patiently waiting for the slide to move. Um, so Joel had asked, were these seed or clone plants or a combination? So in the variety trial last year, the majority of those varieties were from seeds. Um, there were a few um, plants that were, were planted from clones that were sent to us from one of the companies. And do we have any autoflower varieties? Yes, we do. We had a few last year um, and you can see all these in our variety trial report, which is posted online and maybe Catherine um, can put the website in there. Uh, and we have a few more autoflowers this year. That's so weird. Why are the slides not moving? Hmm little there we go okay so how did the nitro nitrogen rates impact the cannabinoid levels and the thc levels so what we commonly hear is if we over apply nitrogen um, the thc levels will spike and honestly um you know if thc levels are going up cbd levels go up with them they don't like one doesn't go up really without the other one going up too but you can see from our study, we actually didn't really see that happen. We didn't see um, the THC levels go up and there really wasn't any statistical difference between the uh, CBD levels either uh, across the different nitrogen application rates. So what does all this mean? <laughs> um, that we have more work to do, which is why we're repeating this study. and one of the pieces of the study this year is to try to develop some um, management tools that will help the farmers determine if they actually need more nitrogen during the growing season. So we're using some different um, little nitrogen handheld meters, some SPAD meters they're called, um, and looking at the overall more or less greenness of the leaf and trying to determine if we can correlate that to nitrogen need in the plant. And we're working on that project with John Jemison from um, the University of Maine. So we're hoping that to take some of the variation out of all of this by giving you an adaptive tool that can be used in the, in the field. Okay. So lastly, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our hemp harvest state work. We get a lot of questions about when do you know if the hemp is ready to harvest? And is there any tools that I can use to determine if the THC levels are above the threshold? And honestly, really what it comes down to is testing. There, there really isn't any, you know, there's some cues that can be used to determine if you're you know, getting close to harvest, but there's nothing in the field that you can look at that's going to tell you if you've exceeded the THC threshold. Um, and just to be really clear, you know, as CBD concentrations are going up, so are THC concentrations. So, you know, as you continue to push CBD levels, you're going to continue to push the THC levels as well. So, you know, that first sample that you take for compliance at, depending on your state, you know, 28 days before harvest should give you a pretty good indicator of if you need to get harvesting right away or if you have, you know, a few weeks to wait yet. And we've been trying to monitor varieties. So um, we're doing this work again, but just, just to kind of show you the differences here. Um, we looked at box, that's how I pronounce it, cherry blossom and southern su sunset. These are 
varieties that are considered um, early, mid, and, and late maturity. Uh, you can see the flowering week for these. So, you know, box was kind of started the earliest. Cherry blossom was a little bit later than southern sunset, but southern sunset was not mature at 43 weeks, which is when we harvested the, the cherry blossom. Um, and you can see the box was ready to harvest at 41 weeks. So we basically monitored CBD concentrations and THC concentrations um, post flower right up till how, um, sorry, right up until harvest. This year we're monitoring right at the start of flower bud initiation. So we actually started uh, monitoring right around Labor Day. And we're going to continue to do so for about two months. So past when most of these would ideally be harvested so we can get some better data. But I just want to show you some of the photos. Okay. Um, here's the first harvest date for the three varieties. So some people are looking at the trichomes and waiting for them to turn like an amber color. Um, and to darken up. So this was at the first harvest date, which was at, in early October last year. Okay, and then this is the second harvest date. And you can see in the box, the trichomes are getting to be more of an amber color and the cherry blossom, you can see they're getting a little bit cloudy. And here's the third harvest. Um, it actually looks like the box is starting to degrade a bit. Um, and here's the cherry blossom where they're definitely very cloudy. And now in the southern sunset, you're also seeing, seeing more cloudy trichomes. And then here was the last harvest date. So clearly the box um, you can see is very dark amber colored. We're not seeing a lot of amber coloring in the cherry blossom, um, but seeing more cloudiness in southern sunset. So we, we know that the trichome color isn't always actually gonna turn that amber color. <laughs> I do know this because um, we've looked at a lot of varieties and that does not always happen. So that should not be your cue um, on whether or not you should harvest. So getting to know your varieties are really important. So here's what the CBD and THC levels look like across time. So if you look at box, which um, our first harvest day, again, was early October um, and probably, you know, was a little bit early for box, which is considered an early variety, but you can see it was meeting THC and CBD levels. At the second harvest day, um, the CBD levels went up and they continued to go up to the third harvest date and then they started to decline, which probably meant they were just basically degrading. It was past um, the ideal harvest point. But at no time with box anyway, did the levels go over that 0.3 threshold. There is a little anomaly here where on the second harvest date, the THC level doesn't necessarily go up. Um, it goes up a little, but not quite as much as the CBD went up. If you look at the top to the, um, the cherry variety, you can see this one is like, uh, like clockwork, you know, they're right matched up. So this CBD levels um, are going up, 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 and then they kind of level out by the four, fourth harvest state. Um, and it's right at the third harvest state where we've maximized CBD that the THC is also just over 0.3. So again, you know, watching, watching those varieties becomes really important as you're trying to push those CBD levels. Because you can see when we maximize CBD, we're probably also, you know, at a point where the THC may be too high. So again, getting to know the varieties and maybe trying to be a little consistent with growing uh, specific varieties is going to be helpful to you um, in managing them. Lastly, we can just look at southern sunset, um, which again just never matured before harvest. And you can see the levels are, are pretty low. Um, and they started building and they probably would have continued to go up if we had more season. 
So we are conducting that study again this year, um, but again, starting earlier and we're gonna go later and we're using a number of varieties again, but the point is some of these magical cues that we think are best for determining harvest probably aren't always true. And testing really is the way to determine um, if you're gonna go over those levels. So I'll, I know I'm already over time, so. Scott? I'm taking over control here. Let's see, does this work? Can you guys see my uh, PowerPoint presentation yeah. slide? Perfect. Now let's see if I can advance. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to share is already up on our website. Um, and so I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I'm really excited to also hear what Jennifer has to share um, before we end uh, at one. So. Really quickly, Heather's mentioned, um, we've got a group of folks helping us throughout um, the Northeast, looking at, at um, in, entirely um, hemp grown for flower production. We've been scouting for the last couple of years. Um, last year's uh, results are on our website. Um, these are actually the sites. We had 18 sites throughout, um, mostly New England, but we also got into New York. And then this year, we actually have more sites in New York and um, none in Massachusetts, but Connecticut and Vermont. Um, just really quickly, um, we've been going during two critical time periods for growing, uh, during early flowering, uh, and then again, just before harvest. Um, and early on, we're just looking at the plants, um, sorry, just looking at the leaves. Um, and then later on before harvest, we're also looking at those um, cola buds, a terminal, and then four axillary, looking for insects and diseases. Um, I've also been conducting, as a part of a national study, um, looking at, at um, hemp pests throughout the country, and I've also been going weekly for that. So um, we've got a lot of people going through a lot of hemp farms, and I just want to share, um, these are just some, some scouting sheets that we've used. These are on our website, so feel free to take them and adjust them to your needs um, for both insect and disease scouting. Um, but basically what I wanna share with you is what we've been seeing. So the, actually the first um, round of scouting um, that Heather mentioned before, this is a blog post that we put out on um, the end of August, just sharing basically what we saw in that first um, push to, to see what's going on. We saw the typical things that we, we've been seeing every year um, since what, 2017. Um, aphids, flea beetles, potato leaf hoppers are, are the insects that we're seeing and then like Heather mentioned, septoria leaf spot and powdery mildew. Um, so again, this presentation, a lot of this information um, was presented in, in the, uh, our hemp conference. Um, so I'm gonna go through um, the, the biology of these things pretty quickly because you can find that information on our website. Um, but these guys, aphids, I should say gals, um, their populations can grow over the season because they reproduce um, asexually. Um, this year, we have not been seeing a lot of aphids, probably because of the hot, dry weather, um, at least that we've been seeing here in northern Vermont. Um, aphids tend to do better in, in cooler, wetter um, uh, years. And so not seeing a lot of aphids. We did see them early on, and they're almost completely gone uh, at this point. Same thing with flea beetles. Flea beetles, we see that, that characteristic um, sort of shot hole damage in the leaves you see on the bottom. I don't know if you can see my pointer here. Um, we see that early on in the season. Um, and they pretty much disappear uh, at this point in the season. Um, not really an economically important pest, but really common and people often wonder what all those holes in their leaves are about. Um, potato leaf hoppers, um, again, these guys, um, we, saw, we saw a bunch early in the season. There's multiple generations and I have seen some, just a few uh, on leaves later in the season. Uh, they don't really do too much damage, um, but they can suck the life out of your plants. So this is a characteristic hopper burn. Um, and, and again, what happens is they, that when they're feeding on those leaves, they inject a little bit of um, uh, saliva that causes cell death. Um, one of the other things that we were seeing early on in the season, like this picture over here on the left-hand side, um, just tiny little bits of powdery mildew forming early on. Um, the problem is if you get this huge um, uh, out, uh, like increase in powdery mildew on the leaves um, late in the season, they really decrease the quality of, of those flowers. Um, and the interesting thing about powdery mildew is um, unlike a lot of other fungal diseases, 
Uh, you just need humidity. You don't need um, like actual water on the leaf, but just humid, high temperatures and humidity, which um, we see a lot of times in, in August. And so that's why we tend to see powdery mildew um, building up uh, as the season um, progresses. Uh, it's usually a bigger issue out, uh, sorry, indoors, um, but we can start to see um, problems in, in the field. Interestingly, what I'm most curious about is, is whether or not we're going to start to see resistant varieties on the market. So cannabis, um, there are varieties. I think it's used, uh, entirely at this point, the high THC varieties that they know of, um, but, but there are cannabis varieties that they have found powdery mildew resistance. And so that's something that I'm interested to see coming on the market um, down the road for, for industrial hemp. Uh, and then like Heather mentioned, septoria leaf spot, really bad. Um, it, it can be um, a problem more on the lower leaves from the splashing up. Um, but if that problem persists and grows up through the, through the canopy, you can, you can really go downhill pretty quickly. All right, so what I really wanna spend the last you know, couple of minutes uh, sharing with you is what I've been finding in the last couple of weeks, just before harvester, as folks are starting to harvest, right, they're starting to see European corn borer, um, the second generation, I'll show you a picture uh, in a moment. Um, we haven't seen them here in Vermont, but corn earworm can be really problematic in hemp, um, and we're starting to see that uh, in other parts of the Northeast, um, but then the, the big issue are those diseases that are showing up before harvest, gray mold, um, sometimes called bud rot or botrytis, white mold, um, or sclerotinia. I just heard the other day a grower call it cheese. Um, and then a little bit of, like I said, that powdery mildew that, that can be problematic. All right, so European corn borers, there's two generations uh, of the moths that fly. The early generation leads to that lodging that Heather showed a picture of um, before. Um, the next generation, those eggs are laid in the top of the plants uh, and what you get are these really nasty, unmarketable buds from the corn borer just going to town on the flower, pooping all over. Um, really not a pretty sight. The other caterpillar to look out for are corn earworms, um, also called tomato fruit worm or bowl worm. They feed on a whole bunch of different crops and weed species. Um, so they can be really problematic. It's, it's probably the most widespread pest in hemp in the US. Um, thankfully, we don't see um, corn earworm in hemp that much. Um, although I've been trapping for the adults recently and been seeing them every week in, adjacent to the field, but we're not seeing the caterpillars in the field. So I guess we're lucky there. Um, if you're in an area where there are um, corn earworms in your hemp, you can, you can treat fairly easily with, with things like trichogramma. Um, and a neat little trick, you can use like the New York sweet corn trap network um, to monitor for levels of corn earworm and sweet corn, and that can tell you when you might be releasing, it uh, might be a good time to release the, the trichogramma. So um, that's the pro tip of the day. Um, really, like I said, the, the gray mold, um, bud rot, as we're starting to get close to uh, harvest or during harvest, you have those cool nights um, and uh, lots of dew on the plants, you can get a lot of that, that bud rot in there. Um, botrytis is a little bit trickier to, to control, for because they can survive periods without plant tissue. Um, and so uh, it's really important, Heather has mentioned a couple of times, the importance of, of um, rotation, uh, particularly for botrytis. Um, rotating, getting rid of plant debris um, are gonna be really important strategies. Um, and then the other thing we're, we're seeing a bunch of is this white mold or sclerotinia or cheese, like uh, that one grower described it. Um, and again, rotation is really important for this. Um, you know, I, ha I actually quickly changed my, my presentation as Heather was talking. So I have in here, it can survive for many years and, and, and Heather just mentioned up to six years. I have at least two or more years that it can survive in the soil. Um, and it also attacks a lot of broadleaf, leaf, broadleaf weeds. Um, and so really, really important. I cannot say em enough rotation, rotation, rotation. Um, and, and you know, as an entomologist, I have to plug integrated pest management, right? The scouting is really key to managing for diseases uh, and pests. Um, at this point in the season, other than burning the whole field down, what are you gonna do? Um, certainly there are things like if you know you're going to have a, a botrytis problem because the conditions are conducive and you've already got some inoculum in the field, go ahead and start pulling those plants early, um, removing um, the infected plants, 
uh, making sure that you clean up at the end of the season, um, cultivate to keep um, you know, the airflow going. Uh, those are really important things. And I, I breezed through this mainly because I wanted to give Jennifer a good 15 minutes to, to, to share what she has. Um, but again, everything that I have um, is on our website. Um, so if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, Jennifer, you're, you feel free to, um, to steal control. Uh, and I'll see if there are any questions here. So um, species of aphids. So cannabis aphid is the primary species um, of, of aphids. There are other aphids that you can find, um, but, but it's certainly cannabis aphid. Uh, and then how long can botrytis survive without a hemp plant to infect? Um, I don't know how, certainly for, for well over a, a year, I'm not sure, uh, Jennifer, do you happen to know? I see you're shaking your head. Um, how I, long Botrytis? Well, I was going to say, it's not just hemp plants is the problem with Botrytis. And yeah, so, sorry. right, like um, uh, I, I, that's been the, the kicker for determining the appropriate crop rotation for hemp is that it shares pest species with other common crops, right? Yeah, exactly. So it can survive the winter on no host but then can survive subsequent years on alternate hosts. Right. Exactly. All right. I think yeah. it's all yours. And we didn't have the dry, hot summer that you had. We had an off the charts wet summer. And so we are seeing mold problems like it's nobody's business. And, um, and not, just down, not just powdery mildew, but downy mildew also. Uh, and lots so I'll consider myself lucky. <laughs> yeah, lots of people going, but it was great a week ago, and now I just lost everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, okay. So I have a um, a video that I'm going to show that is, uh, you know, four minutes long. It's not that long, but uh, I, I I just want to sort of set it up first. Um, we've been growing for a number of years now, and our 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 funds here at Morrisville tend to be a little bit limited, and so. For our cannabis uh, production course, we um, are, are teaching our students breeding techniques from the materials that we have. So I have lots and lots and lots of grain and fiber varieties. Um, then um, we had a donation of five or six common CBD varieties. So I saw some of them on the list there, the lifter, the Suver haze, we had Hawaiian haze, uh, there, there was a bunch of them. Um, and so we started doing crosses between them. Um, my main, my personal main focus is grain and fiber production. And so um, as I'm talking to our horticulture department, the things that we discuss are things like, well, if you want to have a secondary crop, if you want to be able to harvest the flower and then do something with the stalk, we have to change how this crop grows. Um, so last year we um, did a, 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 a ton, well, no, no, it was two years ago now, we did a ton of crosses um, in the field. We let um, males stay and uh, fertilize our females and came up with a number of crosses between these CBD varieties and Felina 32. Um, and I chose Felina 32 as their second variety to grow uh, as their grain and fiber variety to mix into the field because it, it has consistently for our New York farms here. And, and this is not what Cornell's data has shown, but for my for all of my variety trials that I've done, Felina 32 wins in our fields time and time again. So in non-controlled environments, we're not doing um, you know small plot variety trials. We're doing I have a whole bunch of farmers and they're growing whole fields for me. And the Felina 32 has been winning every time in terms of hardiness to our climate and um, and. Uh, harvestability. So that seemed like the right variety to cross with the CBD varieties. So at the end of the growing season last year, we had a bunch of F2 generations that we collected flower from and, and sampled. And um, of those, 
most of them had two or three percent CBD in them, but a handful of them had nine, 10, and 12 percent CBD in them. And so they were growing in the shape of a felina shape, so a thin stalk that can be harvested and then ha have fiber. Um, usefulness than with the, the flower properties that we wanted. I, I should say there was a lot of variability. And so one of the things that comes up here is that the genetic instability, right? So even with the variety trials that we do, when there's genetic instability, one year you might have a great response and the next year, not so much. So um, I have a quick four minute video to show of um, of that variety trial and the difference, um, I think it is, I think this is the one that I want. I just wanna make sure I'm on the right thing for you. Is that, nope, that's not gonna work, it's that one. There we go. Um, so you can all see that. Yep. Okay, so hopefully you'll hear it in a second. Um, I want you to, so what we're going to look at is how we're choosing, because we're not, we're not genetically testing them, we're choosing them phenotypically. And so you get a feel for the difference in how each of these are growing. Um, the majority, so this is F3 generation, the majority of the plants in this field are all the same variety that um, we collected the seed from the couple of plants that we liked. And you can see there's still a huge amount of variability there. So that didn't work the way I wanted it to. There we go. Maybe. Hmm. It worked when we tested before everybody came on. It worked perfectly. <laughs> let, let me try this again and see. Oh, Was it playing for you? I didn't see anything. Okay. Okay. Is this part of this the whole delay thing that Heather was seeing? No, oh, mine was really not doing anything. Because it worked perfectly. I I also thought that when we tested it out right before everyone came in, that it was a little scary that it worked so perfectly. And so like something might be wrong. Because <laughs> how else has that ever happened? I'm gonna try and move this ahead a little. Okay. So maybe oh. if I take it to there. And now try. Genetics. There we oh. go. Up on its fur, showing itself. Um, we got our really small, short, odd seed. You know, these were one and three further along in flowering. Then we have this later stage flowering, more narrow leaves, a bit taller. Then we have our really like big and shrubbier plants. So oh, these are all, all from the same mothers. But they don't have that odd leaf structure. And the odd leaf structure that he's talking about was instead of having your five leaflet fan, they had one and three. based off its phenotype, which is the visual characteristics. See how tall and skinny those are. The next generation that we'll take seed from. You see, this is a pollinated female. You can tell by feeling uh, the flower, but if it's been pollinated or not, pollinated before we can get the males out. So, but some of these that are, you know, that's a very small flower. So we said maybe it's maybe one seed, maybe two, but that's good if we get a good cultivar that has a couple of seeds in it to flower. Um, we can uh, mark it off. This one broke. This is a, actually a good example of wind damage. Uh, this is a more, you know, brittle stem, or maybe it's because of its placement in the field, wherever the storm came from, but we lost. We didn't lose it. We necessarily, we just, uh, it was broken and we decided that we're just gonna leave it as is. And it looks like we're still gonna get product out of it. We'll still get CBD flower. Um, so, and then it's just how the others, some of them were you know, really, really snapped pretty good, like four directions there. But the plant is pretty resilient. Um, here we had another pretty bad breakage tell what direction the sun hits them most of the day. You can see it from over here, a bunch of different scenarios. We're talking in season um, problems, things that happen. So our decision here, 
instead of pruning off the branches and you know maybe letting this one get big we decided we're just gonna we're just gonna let it go and let it heal itself and see what happens and it looks like it may pay off for us so we're letting the wounded ones keep going to see how resilient they are since this since this is a crossing study and we don't know so much about each of the different varieties the less that we manage them, the more we can learn from how, how strong they are. Right, and so this is a really small plot that is just across from campus, but it's set back off of the road a little bit. Um, and so, if folks don't often notice it there with a s single string of wire around it to pretend that we're deterring the deer there's six cultivars here some are showing like earlier flowering and that's like a blend of 32 characteristic and then some of them are showing like later flowering which is like a wine haze or sour space candy height is sour space is a sour space candy characteristic while short and bushiness is more of a wine haze short and bushy is more of a characteristic wine haze so um we did also pinch a lot of them though so that uh kind of can mess with the data a little bit but we've also harvested you know some of these cultivars the seeds that we selected from we harvested over a pound of cbd dry cbd flower off some of these plants testing at 20 percent cbd so it was 12 not 20. <laughs> of our crosses and looking forward to so were there males out there this year? Um, there were, yes, there were some males out there this year. Um, there were some that were, you know, had both male and female flowers because um, I didn't grow anywhere near campus this year. And so that's the only place where, where that would have come from. Um, but uh, our, our, we have just a, a spreadsheet of every variety that's out there and sort of taking notes of what we're seeing each time that we're monitoring to say, okay, well, how is this, you know, these are the ones that broke. How are they healing from that to get a feeling for which are the ones that we want to collect seeds off of for next year's uh, transition? Because um, uh, my, my separate mission is to make these fiberable. Right, so that you can process a stock that is, you know, thumb thick as opposed to CBD stock thick. So yeah, a bunch of um, few years ago, anyway. I don't know how many years we we looked at Carmagnola. I think that's how it was pronounced. Yep, because the the breeders or developers of that wanted to encourage this sort of dual purpose crop and that particular variety had anywhere from like four to seven percent cbd and it was a fiber type yeah um, i don't even know where to get the seed anymore yeah i think there's a couple of eastern european companies that still sell it but yeah. i think that for for us this was more of a, can we keep the high CBD content, like not do a traditional dual crop where you're harvesting the flower when you're harvesting for the fiber, but the other way around that the fiber that you're getting from the flower plant is still usable. Yeah, hmm. so very cool. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> was that a student that was doing the video? Um, that was, uh, he, he is now a staff, but he was a student like five or six years ago. And so he is uh, on the younger side. <laughs> um, but we have a couple of students that have done, uh, research projects and, uh, their research projects on our CBD grow were, were, uh, comparing clear mold, uh, clear plastic, white plastic and black plastic. Um, and so that was one of the projects that got decimated by the uh, the steel of our field yesterday. But you know, it, they they had some early data from it that was good, but not some late season data. They they really wanted to harvest and see the difference in in low flowers. But oh well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when will you go out and harvest the seed from those varieties? 
Um, we'll probably let them go another week or two. Um, and then as they harvest them to play with the flowers and it, we, in our processing classes, they'll, they'll go through every stage of from harvest to, to extraction. Um, and at that point they'll collect seeds. Wow. Well, that'll be great. I can't wait to see what happens next. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, it looks like a lot of people are hopping off. I know Scott has to go to class. I know Jennifer has to go to class. <laughs> Probably getting like coming in as we speak. Um, do you have time for one quick question? Why did you choose to grow CBD style instead of fiber density? Um, I'm trying to look at that question to see. In the chat. Oh, it's in the chat. Yeah. Why did I choose to grow CBD style instead of fiber density? Um, well, so this is in our CBD grows, right? In our already in our CBD crop, we're trying to um, uh, see, can we change the shape of the plant so that it becomes more useful for a dual purpose because of how hard, even though there's herd is perfectly useful, it's really hard to process the huge, thick, stocks of CBD grows. And so um, we're trying to figure out, can we keep our CBD concentrations high, but by using some of the fiber type varieties, change the phenotype. Great. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to take questions via email if anyone has any, but I'll see you soon. Great. Thank you. Well, everyone, everyone has left us. <laughs> it's a bu busy time of the year. Jennifer and Scott both um, teach classes, a lot of classes. Jennifer does. I think she was saying she has five this um, semester at SUNY Morrisville. So it was great to great to hear from them and what's what's happening um, in New York and and to learn a little bit more about the pest survey um, as. I think Catherine put in the in the chat, all of our materials are on the website. So anything that we talked about today with the research that we're doing is posted there. So we share, share everything that we do. Um, of course, this year's results aren't ready yet. Um, and it takes a little bit to process everything after harvest. And usually they get posted generally after the new year, but we work hard to try to get them up as soon as possible. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have some great webinars coming up on marketing. Um, and now that we have solutions to everybody's issues around selling hemp, but Rose is a great um, business planner and works with a lot of farms in Vermont and beyond and will be presenting some of her strategies um, that she's developed over time working with different hemp growers. So hopefully you can join us for that three part um, series. And I think that is it for today. Um, there was a question about, again, the best variety to grow outdoors in Vermont and I really think it depend, really depends on your goals um, as a producer, what type of hemp you're, you're looking to produce. If it's CBG, CBD, are there certain terpenes? Is it both? Um, are, are you mechanically harvesting? Are you harvesting by hand? Are you selling for smokable flour um, or extraction? All those... Um, component, where are you in Vermont? I mean, many of us have shorter seasons um, than what we have here up in Alberg at the research farm. So there's a lot of, you know, what, what ifs or, or it depends, I guess. So going through our research reports will hopefully help you kind of comb through what's out there, what's available for varieties and what might fit best for what you're looking to do. There are clearly what I would consider some, you know, varieties that seem to fit really well um, in our production scheme. Um, 
and they they kind of prove themselves in the data as you'll see. Um, Shuresh, you had a question about um, yeah the the CBD levels being really low and the THC levels being pretty high, and you showed a couple varieties. Um, I'm I'm wondering, I, we have not necessarily had that issue. I will say that we have had years where the CBD levels were far lower than what is shown um, or indicated by various company data. Um, part of what I'm wondering though is when, when were the varieties planted and um, were they planted from seed or were they planted from um, clones? So one of the things that I that we have found from our research is, um, you know, you can plant hemp pretty late into the season. So you know, even into July or into end of June, I should say, not July. But the later you wait to plant, um, the yields start to decline. But the other thing that really goes down is the CBD concentrations. So the level of CBD um, tends to be quite, quite a bit lower the later you wait to plant. And I'm assuming it has something to do with the number of weeks that that plant is really given to build up CBD um, concentrations temperatures as well. Um, it could also be the rainfall, like uh, significant water that people have had. There is some data showing that stress does not affect um, cannabinoids, but I, I don't really agree with that. Um, so those are you know, transplanted seedlings in late June. So that could be a little bit of it. Um, I know when we plant in late June, we often have low CBD levels, not that low. Um, so maybe, Shresh, take a look at our planning date study, but that could be part of it. And then um, the significant rainfall as well. But I haven't, I ha we haven't really seen levels that low. I don't know, does anybody on the call have any, any other information that they might share? Um, Shares has very low CBD, 1.7, and very similar THC levels. Nobody's chiming in. Uh, Bob, I see you have your hand up. I I wonder if um, Catherine can unmute you. I think he, hopefully you're going to answer the question about wet um, wet samples versus dry samples. Can you hear me, Heather? Yep, perfect. Yeah, um, you, you have to sample wet, so there is no choice in that matter, and you have to send it to the lab wet as well, so for pre-harvest sampling. So it, it should be accurate, and they should be um, presenting those as dry weight, so they'll hopefully extract the wet material and then do a dry weight um, moisture test, and then they'll adjust the values accordingly and report it as dry weight. So just make sure your laboratory is... is uh, presenting dry weight to you in your COA. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Did I put my hand up accidentally? <laughs> yes. Okay. You did, but I'm really glad you did. <laughs> okay. I was trying to get the question and answers. <laughs> Great. All right. Any any other questions? Um, thanks, Chelsea, and I'm glad um, Bob was able to answer that. And um, if you don't know, Bob, he works for the Agency of Ag in the testing lab. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, everyone. Well, that will conclude our webinar for today. Sorry, it was again a bit fast and furious today because of everybody's crazy schedules. Um, we do have some great webinars coming up and hopefully we'll see some of you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Bye.